All right, while well, everyone's grabbing their cookies, uh, thank you everyone for being here, especially on a Friday in August. Uh, really appreciate it. I'm Michael Johnson. I'm the Department of Energy's Chief Information Officer, and it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you to DOE's seventh uh, Cyber Distinguished Speaker Series. A um, couple things up front. At DOE, strategic and high-performance computing is central to our mission in national security, science, and energy. DOE's mission has historically depended on the most powerful computers in the world. In national security, simulations performed on supercomputers help ensure safety and reliability of the nation's nuclear stockpile. In science, supercomputing underpins advancements in materials, chemistry, particle physics, biology, and climate. DOE's strategic computing efforts are focused in a number of areas, including accelerating the delivery of a capable exascale computing system, establishing a viable path for future HPC in the post Moore's Law era, and on the public-private collaboration, increased capability and capacity of an enduring national high-performance computing ecosystem. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our guest speaker, Dr. Winfred Hensinger, who is the director of Sussex Center of Quantum Technologies, professor of quantum technologies, and head of the Sussex Ion Quantum Technology Group at the University of Sussex in Brighton, England. Dr. Hensinger holds a PhD in the field of experimental nonlinear quantum dynamics with ultra-cold atoms and has spent an extended period of time at the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Today, his group at the University of Sussex works on constructing a trapped ion quantum computer demonstrator device, a quantum simulation engine, as well as portable quantum sensors in collaboration with a number of academic and industrial partners. Importantly, Dr. Hensinger and the University of Sussex are a critical part of the UK's National Quantum Technologies Program. Uh, just a personal note, uh, as many I've shared with many of you in person, uh, I've been working in the field of strategic computing the majority of my entire career, and I have to tell you, without a doubt, uh, Winnie is uh, without equal in his ability to explain very complex topic of quantum computing, uh, both clearly and with passion. And with that, I very much uh, look forward to welcoming up Winnie. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here and thanks for inviting me. It's lovely to be back in Washington. So I've, I've lived here for around half a year, previously 10, 10 15 years ago. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to tell you about quantum computing and, and I'm very happy to have questions during my talk, so please ask questions at any time you, you feel like and there's no stupid questions or ask anything at any time. I'm more, more than happy to, to, to uh, give it my best shot to, to tell you about this. Oops. Right, so before I start telling you about quantum computing, I should really acknowledge uh, the people in my group who do all the work in, in making these really fantastic achievements. Uh, so this is my group at the University of Sussex. And, and obviously, also very importantly, I should acknowledge uh, the people who give us the money to do this incredible research. And, and you can see this is a very broad spectrum, both of UK funders, European funders, and US funders. And, and so this is really critical in, in, in making this happen. Right, so, so let's start right from the beginning and let's start, what is quantum physics? So, so hands up, who, who, who has heard of quantum physics before? Okay, that's fantastic. So, so in, and these are kind of the big headlines uh, which, which people know about quantum superposition. It means like I can be here and over there at the same time. That happens with, with atoms, it actually happens. An atom can be in two different places at the same time. Quantum entanglement, really strange thing, really weird, like a correlation between two distant particles and, and Einstein called it spooky, so really it is very, very strange. And, and nothing gives rise to something, so vacuum fluctuations. That means out of a complete nothing, something can emerge. So, so that's a, another quantum effect. And, and, and then obviously we've all heard about wave particle duality, that things sometimes behave like a particle and sometimes they behave like waves. Okay, um, so, so let me, let me uh, okay, so, so these are kind of some of the weirdness things about quantum physics. So a mechanical object can be at two places at the same time, an atom moving forward and backwards simultaneously. Imagine you 
step into your car and you hit the car in front of you and the car behind you simultaneously. That's what in quantum physics that happens. An object tunneling through a solid wall and entanglement, uh, spooky actions at a distance. So these are really kind of very, very strange effects which we don't really see in our environment, but they happen when you prepare a system in a certain way. And, 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 and in a way, quantum physics has been many years, 10, 20 years, where people uh, try to explore quantum physics, trying to understand it. And, and now we're kind of in an age where we, rather than trying, just trying to understand it, we're trying to build a new technology out of these very, very strange things. So, <coughs> so, so let me just tell, tell you like a very, very, um, uh, what's the word, overview thing. What is a quantum computer? So, so quantum computing is an entirely new type of technology. It has nothing to do with normal computers. It doesn't look like a computer. Right now it fills an entire lab and it's, it's not even a big, it's not even a proper full quantum computer. They're going to be big things. They have nothing to do with normal computers. Normal computers may actually form a very small component of a much larger quantum computer. So, so it's really a whole different technology and the development may follow a very similar trajectory as the develop, development of classical computers. So, so you really have to go back in time and ask yourself how did classical computers actually start? And this is how they started. This is a transistor. So this is in a way your first iPhone, your first supercomputer right here. It's a single transistor. And that's how, how the whole computing field started. Now, and, and Richard Feynman, who is a tremendously smart physicist, he really, in a way, pioneered the idea of, of, of quantum computing when, he's, when he pointed out that when you make transistors smaller and smaller, then these transistors eventually behave according to not classical laws, but according to quantum physics laws. And so, so then, they, then you're going to really have to rethink what happens in a, in a computer altogether. And so this is, um, how many of you, have, all of you guys probably heard of Moore's Law? H hands up, who's heard of Moore's Law before? So this is how, how the speed, how quant uh, comp uh, computers increase their performance. And, and so this has worked extremely well. So if you can, even if you go at home and look at your old computers, you can literally plot them on Moore's Law and you're going to find it works pretty well. But there's a problem, and the problem is that that has now come to an end. So Intel is saying, no, we can't keep up with this anymore. Um, we can't make things much smaller anymore, and the reason for that is because things behave quantum mechanically. And, and so in a way, the, the performance of classical computer kind of will soon see some kind of limitation. Obviously, there will always be ways how you can get, get around this, but really, like, uh, we're now looking at a whole different type of technology to, to enhance computing, and, and this is what quantum computing, uh, quantum computers are. So, so what can a quantum computer do? So why should we care? So why, why can't we just you know, invest a little bit more money into Intel or into some other computing company? Why, why is this so, so great? And, and in a way, it's like we are, most importantly, uh, we are very much at the beginning of this, of this um, development of quantum computers. So what we know right now is very little. So I'm, I'm going to give you some examples of the things we know. So for example, there's what's called Shor's factoring algorithm. So what, what, what can this thing do? Um, if you want to factorize a large number, so if I want to factorize 9 into prime factors, it's 3. 3 times 3 is 9. So that's, that's a problem I can, I can do this in my head. Now, if I ask you to factorize a very large number, you're going to struggle in your head. Now, if I, you're going to have a computer, and eventually it becomes very, very difficult, even for the fastest supercomputer, to factorize a large number into its factors. And this is what, what RSA encoding is built on. The difficulty of factorizing a large number is what keeps RSA encoding safe. A quantum computer, the scaling of how fast um, it can factorize a number goes only polynomial with the number of bits of the number you want to factorize. And a, a classical computer goes exponential. So you can see, like, as, as soon as I got a large enough number, a classical computer just will give up. But a quantum computer, because their scaling is different, things are entirely different. Oops. <coughs> so there's Grover search algorithm, and that's obviously a, 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 a very uh, often uh, used problem is to search a large database. 
So if I have a large ser search space and I want to understand, I want to find one element in that, classical computers uh, take their time. And typically, that time is, is proportional to the number of elements in your database. So, so, so the larger a database is, the, the longer it takes. If you have a phone book and you have to look for the name corresponding to a certain phone number, you're going to have to look at around half the entries till you, uh, approximately till you find that phone number. Um, the, sorry, if you find that name uh, 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 correlated to that phone number. A quantum computer, the scaling is different. So again, like it's, it's something fundamentally uh, different. There's what's something called the quantum Fourier transform, which is the basis for a lot of um, other applications, and this is a very famous um, application of a quantum computer, so a famous quantum algorithm. Now, <laughs> if you're interested to understand what kind of quantum algorithms are out there, there is a beautiful uh, uh, database um, uh, produced by NIST. So this, this is the website here, and you can go in there, and you find around 100 algorithms in there, or even more than 100 algorithms, hundreds of algorithms in there. And that gives you some idea of some of the mathematical problems known today to be solved by a quantum computer. But remember one thing, a quantum computer works entirely different to a classical computer. So you have to develop new algorithms. You can't just run a classical algorithm on a quantum computer. And so we are right now in the beginning days of what a quantum computer can do. So nobody knows what algorithms will be available in the future. And, and really, you shouldn't think that, that a few years into development of a new technology, we have all the algorithms. So what excites me the most about quantum computers is not the algorithms, it's not the ability to factorize large numbers. What excites me most about uh, building a quantum computer is the ability to understand other physical systems. So, so any physical system behaves according to quantum physics. So whether it's, it's this bottle of water, whether it's the material of my shirt, whether it's, it's um, the properties, conduction properties of a metal, all of these things behave according to quantum physics. And what most science is working on right now is trying to produce simple models which can be calculated on a classical computer in order to understand these systems. Now, imagine RF actually have a machine which is capable of producing simulations exactly for a given quantum system. So imagine you're able to, to not just have a rough approximation of understanding to conduction in a metal in order to maybe produce uh, high temperature superconductors. Imagine I, I, I can simulate a system on a, on, a, on a computer which actually very much performs the exact dynamics of the system you're interested in. Imagine what that can do. Imagine where, where you can make progress, whether it's protein folding, whether it is, it is understanding chemical reactions, whether it is uh, new medical cures, whether it is optimizations in, in, um, in financial transactions. Um, the, 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 uh, the choice is really endless. So, so oops, okay. So, okay, <coughs> so. The question I have for you, have we discovered the most important quantum compu uh, computer applications yet? And, and you know, this is something many of you will, will ask that question, so what do we need to be prepared for? What, what is it what this machine can do? And the best thing to answer this question is to look at history. So, so when computers were first, normal classical computers were first built, this is a, a quotation of Thomas Watson, who was the chairman IBM in 1943. He, he's a very, I think he was a very clever man. I mean, he wouldn't start IBM otherwise if you, you know, if, if, you, if you really have a potential and if you really have a potential look in the future. And what he thinks is, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. So here you go. So this is how well you can predict the future in terms of technology, you know. So that's, you know, uh, uh, this is, and uh, I like to read this. This is a newspaper article which uh, tells you a little bit about um, the, 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 the history of how computers were developed. So the electronics people said there were too many vacuum tubes and it would never run. The mathematics people said there were no problems complex enough that computers were needed. Right? And these are smart people. These are really smart people. These are not stupid people. These are people who do this for a living. And so, so in a way, so this is my answer to you, have you discovered the most important applications? We are now around building machines with 15 quantum bits. 
where we go on, where we're going to go to is around millions of billions of quantum bits. So translate this to classical computer and you know where we are in terms of the actual applications. <clears throat> well, let, let's get down to business. Let's get down to quantum physics. So what is, what is a, a quantum mechanical state? So a quantum mechanical state represents in a way a physical system. So it can represent me. So I'm going to associate this funny notation, this zero thing with me standing on the right of the stage and this one with me standing on the left of the stage. So this would be right now my quantum mechanical state. And, and so these quantum mechanical states, they represent some property of the system. And, and um, so this is, uh, you know, now you know already nearly most things about um, uh, quantum physics. The next thing is entanglement. So any, anybody who's heard of entanglement before? Hands up. Okay, who, who understands entanglement? Oh, okay. So, so good. So, so, so entanglement is really hard to understand. Like, like, uh, um, so, so, but there are ways you can kind of get, understand certain aspects to it. And so, so imagine I, I have a coin. I give both of you guys a coin, and you're going to throw, and so you're going to keep on throwing this coin. And you get tails, or, so you get one side or the other, and this completely happens randomly, unless the coin I give you is somehow, somehow you know, manipulated. But, but assume like it's perfectly not manipulated, you get a random answer every time. I give you a coin, and you get a random answer every, every, every time. Now, this is exactly how a quantum system would work. But if these two coins would be entangled, then individually you always get a random answer. But, but strangely enough, you always get the same random answer. So that's one, one example of how a system would be entangled. So this is uh, what's in, what is entanglement. So how do you build a quantum computer? So, so first of all, let's, let's go up and compare classical and quantum bits. Classical bit is either zero or one. So if I write some kind of information into my computer, it's a string of zeros and ones, which is some kind of a language which allows me to encode information. Now the mad thing about a quantum bit is it can be zero and one at the same time. So what does that mean then? So if I put some, a two-bit two number into my classical computer, I can pick. I'm going to get right in zero, one, or I can write in zero, zero, or, or, or if I have only two bits of memory, I, I'm going to have to make a choice. So I'm going to go with this choice, zero and one. Now, a quantum computer with two bits can represent all these numbers simultaneously. So my two quantum bits can already hold four numbers, versus my two classical bits can only, can only hold uh, one number. And in general, a quantum computer can hold two to the n combinations where n is the number of bits simultaneously. So that means you can see how, how quickly this is going to grow. If, I, if n is a large number, imagine how much more information a quantum memory can hold compared to a classical memory. <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you, this is the only a little bit kind of more technical theory part of, of my presentation, but it's important that you know about this. And it's, it's, it's the fault tolerant theorem in, in, in quantum computing. And, and the reason I'm showing you this is because it tells you a lot about the evolution of quantum computers. So, um, so what this means is that, that if all the operations in your quantum computer can have an error then smaller than a certain threshold, then what you can do is you can do error correction. So you can correct these errors and you can show that if all the operations in your quantum computer are smaller than this error, then you can build a large, large scale quantum computer. So this is in a way that the technology threshold you can look at in, in the evolution of technology. You should ask the question, is your, uh, um, are your operations below the fault tolerance threshold? And so, and I'm going to give you the answer right now is, in two implementations, so in two physical systems, one of which I'm going to tell you about, which is trapped ions, we are now meeting these thresholds. And this is in a way tells you a lot about where we are in terms of actually building a device. So, so, um, so let me introduce you. These are the qubits. These are single atoms. Um, they are charged atoms. So that's why we call them ions. They're charged atoms. And this is how they look in the lab. So each bright dot is exactly one atom. And we shine a laser beam onto this atom, and so it starts to rest, and that's how you can see it on a very sensitive camera. So, this is, so these are, each dot you can think of as one quantum bit. And so if you want to understand physics, obviously you've got to go to Tom Clancy. 
right? You all do this, right? If you want to do a bit of scientific study, that's where you go. Tom Clancy, he knows. But actually, in, in, in this particular example, he really does know. So, um, so in order to explain quantum computing in uh, two sentences, here you go. You confine ions in webs of magnetic and electric fields, hit a trapped particle with a burst of laser light to send it into an excited energy state. Then he hit it again to ground it. That's your switch. Rows of ions in a quantum logical gate giving you the smallest, fastest computer on Earth. Neat, clean, and perfect. Now, now Tom Clancy is exactly right. Besides that last sentence here, it's not clean and neat, as you're going to see uh, on a second. No, not quite here, but, but in, a, in a second. It's, it's a full lab full of stuff. But this is actually Tom Clancy got it right here. This is uh, what a trapped ion quantum computer really operates. Yep. So how do you trap ions? So ions, again, are charged atoms. And what you want is some kind of a minimum of a magnetic field. But that's, there's some physics law which doesn't allow this minimum of electric field to happen. And so we're going to have to cheat. And so you cheat by having this oscillating electric potential. So this is how it looks like. Now imagine if I stick something in the middle here. Now hands up who believes I can trap something if I stick something like a ball or something in the middle of this potential. Hands up. Who thinks it traps? And who thinks it doesn't trap? Hands up. OK. So, so, so I'm an experimental physicist. So if I were a theorist, I would give you the appropriate equations. But we have an old record player in the lab. And, and so we, we attach a saddle on top of this record player. And the motor didn't quite work so well, so you have to help. So. <laughs> right. And now, let's see. Here, here's the experiment. Here you go. So an oscillating spinning potential can actually trap something. Now you may say, OK, but this is a mechanical spinning potential. Does it also work with electric potentials? So I'm going to have a second thing here for you. So don't do this at home. Uh, this is very dangerous. It's a lot of voltage. You will die if you do. So, so, so these are these two electrodes here. So you apply a spinning voltage uh, potential between these two electrodes. And here, magically, you have these particles. Here, these are dust particles. So this is big dust, just to illustrate. We rub this dust to charge it. And you can see it, 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 it floats. So you can hold it. So this is how we hold trapped ions using electric fields. And uh, the next step is now to uh, do some kind of proper manipulation. So this is a, a quantum computing microchip we developed at the University of Sussex. And that's really the core, in a way, of the quantum computer. So, so, so the, on this microchip, there's electrodes. These electrodes emit electric fields. And doing that allows us now to, to uh, hold ions directly above the surface of this, of this microchip. That allows us now to build this quantum computer. So this is a um, vacuum system you see here. So, so the, the inside here, inside this vacuum system, that's where the microchip sits. And the trapped ions are trapped just above, above the surface of this microchip. And, and so the vacuum has to be really good, because you're dealing here with individual atoms. So you don't want any other atoms just hopping around randomly. So the vacuum has to be better than that of outer, outer space. So if you want to kill yourself, it's better to step outside of a space shuttle in outer space than being inside this vacuum system. So there's much less air. So it's really very, very good vacuum. And so this is coming back to Tom Clancy. So you can see now this is not neat, clean, and perfect. <laughs> so, but everything else is kind of correct. So you see here a bunch of lasers, a bunch of optics. Um, you see the vacuum system here. And here actually you see a classical computer, which in a way operates the quantum computer. So it sends signals to all parts of the experiment to the quantum computer to actually run the quantum computer. So this is what's going on here. There's lasers, there's vacuum system, fantastically good vacuum system where the microchip sits. And this is where we then do the quantum computing operation, operations. And this is very, very small. This is pictures, in fact, already a little bit older. We have already a much more powerful device. But again, it's certainly not neat clean or perfect. It's, it's bigger and, and, and uh, quite messy. So, so let me give you an overview of worldwide progress in, in, in research and quantum computing. So this is just a selection of, of achievements. So, so people entangled up to 14 ions. So that's, that's one ingredient, for example, entanglement of multiple ions. They entangled ions and photons. They're done teleportation. So this is what got me into physics in the first place. I watched Star Trek as a kid. And, and so, so I can say now I actually work in teleportation. This is kind of cool. 
So, so my, my sister actually told me I'm not going to be a fan of Star Trek when I'm, when I'm, when I'm growing up, and so I've proved her wrong too. So now I'm actually developing this stuff. So, so things like very small error rates for your quantum computer. So this is, this is very important because remember this fault tolerant threshold means that if your error rates are small enough that you can build a large scale quantum computer, you can do error correction and, and so you can build large scale devices. And various quantum algorithms have been, have been implemented like factoring and things like that. So what is missing here? Why haven't we got a full scale uh, proper quantum computer yet? Why are your credit card details still reasonably safe on, on, uh, when you put them on the internet? So, so right now we're kind of like in this realm of single vacuum tube technology and this is what we're building say maybe in the next four or five years, like a big scale device. So this is equivalent in classical computing, this is what we now do with quantum computing. The way we do this is building arrays of trapped ions. So, so, so basically you have a place like your memory, like in your classical computer where you save the information. Then you have some kind of processor zone where you, where, you, where you then do all the quantum gates and you have to have some way to shift that information. And one way to shift that information is by physically transporting these ions using electric fields from this place into that place by just shuttling them, transporting them. And so I Chung at MIT came up with a nice little simulation. He shows how would he actually operate a quantum algorithm. And so you can see this, these dots are uh, 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 little, little atoms um, and they're being moved around. You can see these, these little laser beams here so that they demonstrate entanglement operations. And so, so if you look at all of this, this tells you um, a very, in a very detailed way how a quantum algorithm would actually be physically executed using trapped ions. So, so you just follow these atoms which are being shuttled like in this little Pac-Man game and that is a very simple quantum algorithm. So how do you encode information in an atom? And what we use is the spin. So it's the trajectory of the electron which goes around the atom. And there's two types of spin, two types of possible orbits of the electron if you wanted to. And so we have the red orbit or the black orbit. So that's, you can think of it this way. And so the red orbit corresponds to our zero state and the black orbit corresponds to our one state. And so this allows us now to encode information in the quantum computer using these spin states. And now you can do a controlled NOT gate. So you go from, depending on the state of the first bit, it changes the second, the second bit. So you can see, for example, if the first bit is uh, if it's one, then the and the second bit is zero, then it flips the second bit. So that's what we call as, as the NOT gate. But if the first bit is zero, and the second bit is uh, whatever it is, then it won't flip that. So that's what we call a C not gate. So that's the most fundamental operation inside a quantum computer. Now obviously you could have it that the first bit is zero and one at the same time. Then it's gonna flip the second bit, yes and not at the same time. So it will flip it and it won't flip it. It's kind of mad, isn't it? So now we know how we encode information in a single atom but now how do we actually uh, do some kind of entanglement? So the, the way you entangle is, you know that you have two charged atoms. So they're charged and they're inside a single electronic well. And, and because they're charged, they repel each other. So if, if I give this guy a kick, then this guy gets a kick as well. And so motion is a data bus. I can think of motion as a way to send information from this bit to this bit, to this quantum bit. That's what we do here. So, so when encode information, this, whether it's oscillating or not, so are the ions oscillating or not? That could be zero or one. And so in order to make a quantum, a quantum gate, this is the way you do it. You initialize the, the internal state of ion one, then you map the internal state of ion one on the motional state of both ions, but give this a conditional kick. So if ion one is zero, then you, do give, uh, then you don't give a kick. If ion one is in state one, then you give them a kick. And so it's called a conditional kick. And then you map the state of both ions, oops, <coughs> just to map the state of both ions uh, um, um, on, so, so then you map, sorry, so, 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 so first you map the internal state of ion one on the motional state of both ions, and then you uh, map the motional state of both ions on the internal state of ion two. 
And so now you've actually entangled iron 1 and iron 2. So you entangled the spin state of iron 1 and iron 2. So traditionally, that is being done in, in technology using laser beams. So you take laser beams and you point them on, on, on the ions, and they can change the, the elect orbit of the electrons, and we call it a spin. But a laser beam can also give a kick. So there's momentum in photons, and they can give a kick. And that's what, what uh, for the last 10 years, people have done. Very famously, there's, there's places in the US which pioneered, so NIST in the US has pioneered uh, this kind of interaction. But the thing is, um, how are you going to do this if you want to build a large-scale quantum computer? So I'm asking you now to imagine having a million quantum bits. So that means you have to align a million pairs of laser beams to the accuracy of a, of a micrometer. So the engineering involved in doing this is very, 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 very um, um, significant. So, so this is not easy. Can it be done? Absolutely. Is it difficult? Yes, absolutely. So we, in my group, <coughs> have now pr pursuing a different approach altogether. And this different approach uses microwave radiation. And so the nice thing about microwave radiation is rather than having, having to have millions of laser beams, we are able to just have a single microwave phone outside the vacuum system, and that allows us to, to perform quantum gates. So we now replace aligning millions of laser beams using, using um, microwave radiation. And so just to give you an uh, idea of the two ta different technologies here, is one, you're going to have to have some kind of MEMS mirror arrays or lots of MEMS mirror arrays. You're going to have to align your laser beams to the trapped ions. Uh, this is very, very... Um, Challenging. You're going to have to have lots of mirrors, and you have to stabilize the amplitude of these laser beams. Uh, now, using microwaves, you just have to take a single horn, you, you irradiate the entire vacuum system, and that allows you now to, to um, eventually make a full-scale quantum computer. So, so this is the way we, we, we do this in the lab, and so this is a little bit of physics here for, for the people who are interested to understand the physics. So, so a what we use is a magnetic field gradient in a, in, on the microchip. And what that micro magnetic field gradient does is it, it produces a force onto an atom if it's in one state, so if, it, if it's in one spin state, but it doesn't give a force if it's in the other spin state. And so what we do is if, as we take, change the spin state using microwaves from here to here, the atom will get a kick, and that is then used in the entanglement gate. So the kick is what we use inside this entanglement gate in order to produce a gate. And so this is an experiment, a very recent experiment we've, we've um, uh, made at Sussex, uh, where we show the principle of this approach, and that very recently we managed to make this work. So there's a, the trapped ions are right here in the center, and these are magnets, which produce a magnetic field gradient inside this trap. And so one of the fantastic things we have been able to achieve is we have been able to, if you have two ions eight micrometers apart, then using this method, we are able to, by scaling the frequency of, of one particular uh, my, uh, RF field in this experiment, we can now either address this, this ion, you can see this peak here, corresponding to the left ion, or this ion, just by scanning the frequency. So we are now able to address individual ions space close to eight microns, just by a dial outside a quantum computer on, on, a, on an electronic box, rather than having to imagine a linear laser beam somewhere in your system. And this is also a recent result. So this is a two qubit microwave quantum gate. And you don't, ha don't worry too much what you see in this picture. That won't mean much to you. I'm just showing this for, for, for any engineer here in the audience or whatever knows a little bit about quantum physics. What we've been able to do is to producing a very, very small error uh, using this new technology. And so this shows you that you can build a quantum computer using this new type of technology. So, so how can we make these gates even better, reduce the error rates even smaller in order to build a large-scale quantum computer? I mean, and wh why am I asking this is because Many of you guys will have that question is, though, when will we have a quantum computer? When will we be able to break RSA encoding or things like that? And so these are the questions you, you should be really asking. Um, uh, what, what kind of technology evolution do we need for this? And so this is a, a quantum computer microchip, which in a way has all these ingredients on the microchip, what I showed you before on a bigger experiment. We develop these microchips now. And so this is a particular type of microchips which has current carrying wires 
below integrated in the in the in the in the microchip itself, and that allows us to produce um, produce even lower error rates for these quantum gates. So this is a new type of microchip which we developed recently, and this is <coughs> actually also in in in, in action collaboration with the work on this with the Army Research Laboratory here in the U.S. Um, so where we actually trying to make microchips like this. So 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 this is this is a, a picture of the microchip, and we have great currents below the surface. These currents produce a magnetic field gradient above the surface that allows us to create these chips. So I'm going to tell you about a paradigm of, of quantum computing with trapped ions. And a paradigm is if you if you look at this little picture, you see all these zones everywhere, and you have to. Imagine you have to shoot laser beams in, into all these zones. And if, imagine you have a quantum computer with a million or billion quantum bits. Imagine how many laser beams you need to align to do entanglement operations. So, so what this new, uh, so the number of radiation fields in your quantum computer uh, required scales with the number of bits in your quantum computer. So a large quantum computer needs a lot of radiation fields. And so this means a huge uh, physical resource. So it means something which is, which is tremendously uh, hard to engineer. And so what this new approach does, it, it goes away from, from this paradigm altogether, introduces a new paradigm where you apply voltages on, on the microchip in zones. And these voltages, in collaboration with these uh, global radiation fields, they execute quantum gates. So, so what you see here is, is, in a way, a whole new way of do, doing quantum computing, where you have, you know, uh, uh, for example, where you, by applying a voltage, you change the, 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 the splitting between your qubit, and by doing so, you can now address exactly, in parallel, do all the quantum gates on your quantum computer in parallel. So you can now replace all these millions of laser beams by just applying voltages to your quantum computing microchip and by doing so, you, you take all the engineering away, which maybe, maybe previously made us feel it's very hard to build a quantum computer. So this is, this is in a way, a, a, I would call a, a big step to, to simplify the engineering tremendously in order to actually have a quantum computer um, reasonably uh, workable. So, so the next question you may ask, so how is it going to look like? So how, how, how to build a large-scale microwave ion trap quantum computer? So how, how do you go about this? And, and the answer is you're going to have some kind of array, so an entanglement zone, that's where you perform your quantum gates, some kind of loading zone where you, where you load your qubits, so your individual atoms, into the architecture, and somewhere where you detect the quantum state of, of, of these ions. And this is the type of microchip we use for, for this kind of thing. If you're interested to read a little bit more about the engineering, there's, there's a paper on, on the archive server which gives you a lot more technical details. This is the microchip which we developed <coughs> for this purpose. The ions are trapped above the surface. And now this microchip, this is actually a picture of an X-function microchip we developed. So you can see these electrodes here. They emit these electric fields. The electric fields now allow us to shuttle ions across the surface, around the corner, and you could have an entanglement zone here, you could have a, a detection zone here, and so on. So this is the actual looks of one of these uh, quantum computing microchips. Uh, uh, so below the surface, we develop these mi hybrid chips where you have detectors integrated in the microchip, which uh, measure the fluorescence of the, of the trapped ion as it emits photons. It has decks and things like that, so, so which produce voltages applied to these electrodes. And a few other things, this is the, the structure of this microchip. So there's current carrying wires below the surface, which allow us to produce the magnetic field gradient, which you again require to do entanglement. So, so this is what you, what you um, have right below the surface. And now, this is kind of how it looks like. So you have the, photo, the, the detector integrated in, in, into the um, zone of where we trap ions. You have backside loading of ions um, <coughs> at, at, at the back of these chips where you shoot a beam of beam of atoms coming through the back. Um, you have fancy photo detectors integrated into your surface. And now, if you want to build a quantum computer, you have to have some kind of modularity. Because remember, like, if you want to build a large-scale quantum computer, you're going to need millions of qubits. 
And so how do you obtain this modularity? How do you make comp quantum computer modules and how do you bring them together? One way to, make, to achieve this modularity is have some kind of device like this. So this is, this is uh, the, the, say, the quantum computer device. The atoms are here trapped above the surface. Um, and how do you connect it to the ne next module? One of the ways to connect to the next module is to use, to couple the quantum state of the ion onto that of a photon and then send these photons through optical fibers to connect to other modules. And there's very many serious approaches, both in the UK and in the US, trying to achieve exactly that. The reason why this is very challenging is because coupling the quantum state of an ion to that of a photon, the state of the art right now is 10 hertz. So 10 hertz is very, very slow, and, and that really bottlenecks the speed of your old quantum computer. So in my group at Sussex, we, we, we use a different, or we develop a different approach where you take modules like this, but you then align these modules uh, reasonably close. And what we've developed is an approach where you can transport an ion from one module to another module. So you can see this here. So this is a module on the left, module on the right, and these are the ions, and you can shuttle them now over to the other module. And the technolo technological challenge is to align these modules well enough by 10 micrometers. But 10 micrometers is not really that hard. So, so there's microfabrication techniques where people align things a lot better than 10 micrometers. So this shouldn't be very difficult. And so this allows us to transport quantum information from one module to another module at a rate of maybe 100 kilohertz or megahertz, which still doesn't sound uh, that impressive, but it's, but it's actually tremendously impressive for the operation of a quantum computer. Because one thing you need to know is that quantum computers don't actually need to be very fast in terms of clock speed. So a quantum computer, which even just operates at, at a megahertz clock speed or something, is going to completely blow the hood of any classical machine running at any other clock speed because of this tremendous speed up of how much parallel information you can encode into, into quantum bits. So, so that's something to keep in mind. Speed uh, for quantum computers doesn't actually need to be very fast because you have this tremendous technology speed up. And so this is kind of just to <coughs> give you some kind of engineering. If the, you know, there's, there's some people who are in, interested in engineering of, the, of these things, it shows you a little bit about how you would actually do this. So you at, attach piezoelectric actu actuators on your modules. You then, you then use a special type of substrate, which doesn't bow by, by a certain amount. And then you, can, you can ease, should be easily able to do this as good as 10 microns. And that compares to, to three or five nanometer alignment precision, which is already being realized in other technologies. So this is how this is how a large-scale trapped ion quantum computer is going to look like, and and just to give you a feeling, coming back to the beginning of my presentation, is how does a quantum computer compare to a classical computer? One of the differences is that this thing is going to be around 30 or 50 meters times 50 meters long. So no iPhone quantum computer anytime soon. So these things are serious size, serious technology, serious power dissipation. These are really serious. You know, you're not going to hide one like under your desk anytime soon. So quantum computers, uh, and this is just a vacuum system. You need the supporting electronics for this as well. So, so this, these are real big things. But you can build small quantum computers. And these smaller quantum computers can already perform certain functions. But this is, in a way, kind of a vision of the ultimate quantum computer, which could nearly perform any task. But there are special purpose quantum computers, which can be a lot smaller, which can already, uh, uh, in a way, be quite revolutionary, uh, just about a subset of the task you want a quantum computer to perform. So, <coughs> so this is a little movie and shows you how this design would look like. You start with the, 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 the core of your quantum computer is an X junction. So you, you have your ions loaded and you have two, one, one which you use to cool the other. And so now below the surface you have these current carrying wires. So you, you perform, um, you, these produce a magnetic field gradient. Along with micro, micro radiation, you can produce entanglement between these two ions. And now once you've entangled them, you shuttle the ion, say, to a detection zone. Then using a, what we call a global laser beam, so that laser beam goes across the whole architecture. You don't have to align this um, really well. Um, that now detects the quantum state of this ion, and that's part of the ingredients, the detection of the quantum state we need for a quantum computer. And now, in the bigger picture, what you're going to have to do is now you're going to have to run this all in parallel. 
So you need millions of billions of ions, so you have all these operations going on in parallel, <coughs> just like a nice little Pac-Man game. And so this is not a module, so you can see that module uh, uh, has a lot of different, different things going on in parallel. There's, for example, this module has 36 terms, 36 X junctions. Um, and now you place this module onto a frame, and, and now you place another module next, next to the module, and now you align these modules. You have to align them uh, as good as around 10 micrometers, and once the, once the alignment is reasonable, it's possible for the ions to transport between these modules. So now you can see they can't shuttle yet, but it's, if you align them reasonably well uh, with 10 microns accuracy, then there's a shuttling path, and you now you can transport quantum information from one module to another module. And so now this, this is now really kind of a bit science fiction yet. This is like building a large scale device. And so this is the concept, obviously, the, the, the system engineering, you know, we're going to have to carefully think about how, what's the best way to do this. Um, and, but in a way, you can just keep on scaling this up. You add more and more modules. And, and uh, these modules are relatively small. So, 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 so the whole, but you're going to have lots and lots of modules. And so eventually this device becomes quite big. And eventually you can, say if, if you want your, this particular device to be a certain size then you can still connect using this idea using photonic interconnects to say another uh, quantum computer so 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 to modulize to make modules of quantum computing <coughs> you have a lot of choices and so this is now that that's the way how i a large scale quantum computer would look like so so what do we now so <coughs> It's possible to build a quantum computer with trapped ions. There's no fundamental physics problems which stop us from building one. Uh, it's still as you've seen, and, and, and I, I think I really wanted to focus in my, my presentation a little bit about engineering involved, because I want to show you what, what is actually required to build it. And, and you can see like some of these things are, are non-typical uh, engineering. You know, this is something where, where you need to invest a little bit of time and, and effort. And so the, the time scales, what, what, what are the time scales to have a, have a quantum computer? So, so you need maybe four years. So this is what we plan at Sussex. In the next four years, we're building what's called a demonstrator device. So a demonstrator device is a small quantum computer uh, which doesn't have enough qubits, say, to, to break uh, RS encoding, but it has all, uh, all or most of the te technology required for a large scale device within a small scale device so that you can see that all the technology works together and, and you can smooth out any problems with, with the engineering so that then after that you're able to build a large scale device. And the large scale device is, I would say, still around 10 to 20 years away. And time predictions are very difficult. So, so, so I always say, I think making a prediction up for the next five years is kind of a reasonable thing, but beyond five years is very hard because it really takes, it depends a lot on, on the, the, the investment, what people put in there, you know, how many people are going to work on this. Um, just to give you my personal, personal experience, so we were, my research group was funded primarily by Blue Sky Research Funding, like what do you guys have here, like in the NSF type funding, and, and with that amount of funding you can't really um, carry out the required engineering to, to build a large scale device, and maybe two years ago things changed a little bit, and so, so now we're funded <clears throat> uh, in, in, in different pathways using both defense and, and, and national programs which are, which are focused on producing real technology and things have tremendously sped up just in this time. So, so now where, where governments are starting to invest in the quantum technologies, you may find that these timescales are rapidly changing with, with uh, things moving on a lot quicker. Having said that, it, it, still, it still is very difficult, so, so uh, it's still not easy. So you could throw all the money you have on, onto this problem, you still wouldn't get a, quantum a large scale quantum computer, say, in five years. I, I, I would doubt that, but, but you can certainly get a device which in five years which can solve certain problems uh, faster than any classical computer. So a special purpose quantum computer is already in range of, of five years. So this is something we, for example, are building at University of Sussex in my group as well, the small special purpose machines which may be capable of, of, of producing, um, of, uh, of attacking certain problems very efficiently, but not all the problems. And so, so one thing is quite clear, is, and I, I think even with a very num limited number of algorithms I've shown you is that quantum computers will certainly transfor transform science and society. 
Because what I do is really fundamental. It's not about doing things twice as fast. It's not about, you know, just having a little bit better computer game or like solving that pro one problem you just couldn't just solve. It's a fundamentally different ap approach how to do computing. And the class of problems you can attack fundamentally, fundamentally changes. And we barely have any idea of some of the things it can do. In my opinion, the, 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 the most impressive application of a quantum computer is that really it can solve um, all many scientific problems and scientific don't think of scientific here as just something which is very interesting just for scientists but it could be it could be you know high temperature superconductivity you know and that will change everything i'm, I'm talking to the department of energy here so, so you know so so there's we do, really don't know and and so so let me ask you because you are probably just as good as i to be able to answer this question so what could an unbelievably fast computer which operates unlike any other technology we now do. And, and, and please think about it. Thank you.